Hi everyone, welcome back. Today we're going to be talking about author Nathaniel Hawthorne. So in the first set of lectures about short fiction, I really focus on the elements of short fiction and um, how to use those elements to create a literary argument. In this lecture, I'm just going to be focusing first on Nathaniel Hawthorne, give you a little bit of background about his life, and then talk about two stories by Hawthorne um, and then some of their literary elements that I want you to watch for when you are reading those stories. One of the other things that I'm doing here too um, in this class if you're, if you're watching this for um, either American Literature or English 124, which is Introduction to Literature, um, I want to have some authors who represent different periods of American um, literature. So American Literature goes through several different um, movements. And Nathaniel Hawthorne's work is really representative of the Romantic movement, um, which is the first one we'll be talking about if you're if you're in English 124, writing about literature. And then we'll move on from there to um, realism, and then possibly um, to modernism as well. So we'll talk about those three literary movements and some of the features and how people were using these literary elements to convey their message messages or their stories. I like these pictures of Nathaniel Hawthorne because we get him an old man, middle-aged man, and young. A lot of times we have these pictures of authors just when they're old, um, so it's kind of nice to see him in all his different states. So romanticism in literature, what does that mean? Um, prior to romanticism, we had the age of reason in the United States. So a lot of writing at that point was political writing, um, was philosophical writing, and the fiction that we did get um, was not much. <laughs> the short story um, really comes into fruition with Washington Irving writing at the sort of tail end of that period into the Romantic period. So the Romanticism sort of breaks from this um, logical stuffiness, and it's embracing freedom in both politics and art, um, and art meaning um, not just art as the picture down here, but also literature and music as well. If you take one of our music classes where they're talking about different periods of music, they'll talk about the romantic composers. Here you can kind of see this is an interpretation of a man looking out at the sea and it has a lot more feeling than some of the more realist portraits i'm sorry the more realistic portraits of the earlier times when people were trying to you know paint benjamin franklin and get his face exactly correct right this has more to do with an interpretation of a strong emotion Writers focus on emotions, um, also improbable events. So there's a concept in literature called suspending disbelief. It means that you um, have to put the fantastic kind of out of your mind and, and not say, well, that would never happen, <laughs> to sort of let yourself be swept up in the imagination um, of the author. So an improbable event, which we'll see definitely in the two stories by Hawthorne, and high emotions, um, meaning, you know, rationality is very temperate, very mild, right? High emotions are romance and love and joy and ecstasy. And then we have darker emotions of horror and terror and anxiety anxiety, which um, the, the Gothic writers sort of focus on. Gothic literature, um, including the stories we're going to look at um, in a moment, looks at the darker aspects of humanity. Transcendentalism also was taking place during part of this time, and it looked at more the godlike potential of man. So transcendentalism, if we think about romanticism kind of as a spectrum, um, along like a number line <laughs> um, with five being moderate and temperate and rational. Um, Gothic literature would be like 
uh, at a one on the scale, right? Dark, depression, um, depravity. Edgar Allan Poe stories fit into this as well as as well as some of his poems, right? Transcendentalism is more like a 10 on the scale, looking at how people can be um, generous and caring and good and loving. So we have those kind of two poles of this scale and authors many times um, take one of these two poles. Why? Because the middle is not always so interesting. So romantic ideals kind of died out around the time of the Civil War. We're going to talk about that with Louisa May Alcott's story that we're going to be looking at um, called My Contraband. And when writers begin to turn from idealism and imagination because of the horrors of the Civil War, they and they also after that time, um, you have more people moving around the country as well, um, continuing westward expansion. So people want to look at realistic portrayals of society changing around them. Still using some literary elements, though, not going back to the complete rationality um, of earlier times of the the 1700s. So this period really is, in in the United States at least, and we have a different, um, sort of a different timeline when it comes to, where's my little pen here? There we go. Um, We have a little bit of a different timeline when it comes to Europe, because Romanticism um, in Europe has some different dates. But here we're basically talking about around 1800, very carefully do this with my mouse, to um, about 1860, 1865, those Civil War years. So about a 60-year period in literature where um, a lot of writers and artists and musicians were focusing um, on some of these themes and trying to stir up emotions. They also looked at the past um, as inspiration. So um, looking at uh, if you've ever ever read The Scarlet Letter or pretended to in high school um, or read the the notes on The Scarlet Letter in high school, I think it's a great book, but other people don't like it as much. It's a, it is a little bit slow, but that's pretty typical of Nathaniel Hawthorne's writing, right? It's all about love and jealousy and um, adultery and guilt and those very strong emotions. And looking back at America's past, you know, uh, 150 or 200 years before. So seven features of romantic literature. It's meant to be escapism. Um, You have things taking place, especially in European stories, in large castles. Here in the United States, it's on farms out in the middle of nowhere in the woods. There's a quest for beauty and art, the use of the far away, the non-normal, the antique, and the fanciful. So antique meaning like looking at the even earlier American history, um, looking back um, for Washington Irving, he sort of looks back at um, old fairy tales and kind of reinterprets them, placing them um, in New York State and in some other um, American um, settings. So historical interest in the past, like the Scarlet Letter, characterization and mood. There is an emphasis on the grotesque, as I said, with Gothicism. And we're going to talk about that with Hawthorne stories. The sense of terror or fear, um, things that are odd or strange. Here we come, uh, this from an Edgar Allan Poe story, um, The Telltale Heart, which I know many of you have read. And if you haven't, I don't want to spoil it for you, what exactly he's listening to under the floorboards. But you can see that grotesque face underneath him, right? Um, Interest in the imagination. So again, plots that aren't just things that happen every day. We get that in realism later on. You'll have, you know, two women gossiping over tea, Um that that's going to happen every day. In one of Nathaniel Hawthorne's stories, we have a minister who always wears a black veil and no one knows why. Um, a little bit of an improbability that not even his fiance would be able to see his face. Um, in the other story, Young Goodman Brown, we have a man being tempted by the devil. So again, a suspension of disbelief and sort of some elements of fantasy as well. Now, fantasy as a genre um, is has an interesting development, but we do see some of it in this period. An interest in nature, 
for itself and for beauty, particularly the transcendentalists. The Gothic writers are looking more at the depraved nature of man, um, but transcendentalists are really interested in man communing with nature and coming to know God through nature. Subjectivity in form and meaning. Um, the, these are not reliable narrators all the time. These are not reliable characters. And unlike a rational piece of writing from earlier um, that were very objective and trying to find the truth and show people um, different aspects of uh, philosophy. Um, these are more subjective, so there's not just one straight answer. Experimentation in the form and rejection of old antiquated patterns. So old and antique as a as a subject, <laughs> but not um, in the way that they were writing. It was quite um, quite different and experimental at the time. And going along with that and subjectivity, a lot of symbolism, which you don't get in rational writing because rational writing is objective and straightforward. So there is a very rich symbolism in the two stories um, by Hawthorne and a lot of imagery as well. Romantic writers cultivated individualism, reverence for the natural world, idealism, physical and emotional passion, an interest in the mystic and supernatural, dreams and the fantastic, and the persona of a poet um, or a writer as a highly tortured visionary. Here we have Lord Byron. Um, this is known as the Byronic hero, incapable of love and is solitary and trying to find love, but in self-destructive ways. <coughs> Oops, I'm so sorry. So um, one of the things here and I hope you've gotten it from the notes already, but I should have said at the beginning, a lot of times when I talk about romanticism, people think that I mean romance books or romantic stories. And it's not um, the 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 subgenre of romance, um, having um, romance novels and that kind of thing does sort of come out of this a little bit. You know, you can see idealism, physical and emotional passion, um, sometimes um, plots that are a little bit um, out there. If you ever watch a romantic movie on Hallmark Channel at Christmas time, you kind of know what I'm talking about. Someone goes home and sees a person they haven't seen in 15 years and they fall in love in two days, right? That kind of thing. But really, um, here romantic just is talking about those physical and emotional um, passions and put into the work and that the stories are about strong emotions like sometimes it can be love but other times it's um as like like i said with the scarlet letter guilt um things like deep depression um depravity and some of the gothic writers joy extreme things such as that so let's talk about nathaniel hawthorne his ancestors Major William Hawthorne was known for the persecution of the Quakers, and John Hawthorne was known for, was a stern negotiator, uh, interrogator of the accused witches in Salem. And there's some evidence, possibly, that Hawthorne felt kind of a guilt about um, about his past. Um, his the deeds of his ancestors. You can compare it to someone today whose um, ancestors may have been slave owners or, or plantation owners, right, who had um, slaves. I think it's sort of that same type of guilt. But also at the same time, you know, you do have this return to the things of old. So examining things um, like life in in Salem and the life of the pilgrims would not have been um, unusual. He was born in Salem, Massachusetts, as were generations of the family, going back to his great great grandfather. And his father died when he was four years old. So he went to live with relatives in Maine. In Maine, he also attended college. Um, he became friends with the famous poet Longfellow, um, who's also a, a writer at this time. We might be looking at one of his poems um, in this class. We'll have to we'll have to see if we've got time to take a look at it. Um, and President Pierce and Emerson and Thoreau. So one of the things that's kind of important to realize is that with these literary movements up until 
mm, I would say up until maybe the, the, the 1980s, but really before the internet, you have people who are kind of in conversation with each other. So when we have, for example, in the 1950s, a lot of people will talk about beat poetry, and I even talk about it a little bit in one of my poetry lectures. Um, well, the beat poets were a very small group. <laughs> You're talking about, you know, maybe a dozen guys, and a lot of them know each other. They go on trips together, they're friends, um, and that kind of thing. And s similarly here, a lot of these writers are in conversation. They know each other. They've been educated in, um, you know, similar institutions and stuff like that. One of the things I think is interesting, this is just a very brief tangent, is that um, after the internet, particularly um, the, the taking over of the world by Amazon, you have the ability of anyone to publish their work. So people would do blogging or microblogging. Um, they would have podcasts and video blogs and, um, and, and print their own newspapers or magazines or put out books themselves that they're self-publishing, you know, for free on Amazon. Um, and this is really unprecedented. So you kind of have to think back here um, to the 1800s when it's it's a much smaller group, a literary circle, it would have been called. He began writing for magazines, which is not unusual. Um, a lot of writers at the time um, would write short stories for magazines or articles. <laughs> and um, many started off as journalists as well because they would be interested um, in that kind of um, occupation. Right. One of the ways to work is that you're a journalist and newspapers and magazines at the time would print short stories. So now we mostly have short stories in collections of books and sometimes on some websites that are just featuring short stories. But if you look at old newspapers, you know, they'll have short stories or they'll have a novel that's serialized where part of it would come out every week which is kind of interesting. He published his first novel in 1828, and he's best known really for some of his short stories, um, but also his novels, The Scarlet Letter, The House of the Seven Gables. It's interesting to me, he's considered to be one of the first professional writers in America. I think what that means is that he made his money and he based his life on writing where a lot of other writers either were independently wealthy meaning they had money before they started writing or they had um side hustles <laughs> they had other gigs where they were um working to support themselves so not necessarily the first but one of the first anyway um hawthorne style it is romance. His writing is not just filled with allegories of his Puritan predecessors, though, but they're filled with um, symbolism, imagery, gothic and supernatural elements. And oh, I'm sorry. Uh, when it says the allegories of his Puritan predecessors, what that means is that um, in the Puritan period of writing, in the United States, which I didn't talk about. Puritanism and then rationalism and then romanticism. Um, Puritanism was really concerned with religion, religious imagery, um, poems that are praising God or talking about simple Puritan life. A lot of that comes out of that period. Also a lot of nonfiction. So um, we know about the first Thanksgiving because of William Bradford writing about it. He wrote a, a history of the colony that he was in charge of. So um, some of Hawthorne's work has some allegory and has religious symbolism or religious imagery. Um, but there's more there than than just you know these aren't <laughs> these are not just religious stories they're really gothic um and they're trying to do psychological analysis sort of pre-freud people became interested in how we think and why and and really motivation why do we do the things that we do and um and both of these stories you're going to see a lot of internal conflict because of this he's also praised for having a distinct a distinctly american voice so um edgar Allan poe as well um is a, another author a, around that time period who was distinctly American. Short story writer Washington Irving had a lot more European influences than Nathaniel Hawthorne. Irving is interested in, you know, um, 
you've ever read The Legend of Sleepy Hollow um, or the um, story Rip Van Winkle about the man who f- sort of is tempted by the little men in the hill and then gets drunk and falls asleep. Um, those are kind of, you know, really, really influenced by the Dutch settlers in that area, but also um, Europe where Irving spent a large portion of his life. But uh, Hawthorne is writing about American things and these take place in America and they're about Americans um, and and the life in the United States at that time. Um, so major themes to look for. Alienation. How is one person set apart from the group? You'll see uh, in the corner there a picture of um, a depiction, an illustration from young Goodman Brown. We'll talk about that in a moment. Guilt, pride, personal pride, physical pride, spiritual pride, being intellectually proud, and then th- the fall from pride, right? The fall from grace. Hypocrisy, Puritanism for sure, but also other small isolated communities. Hawthorne wrote a, a book also about um, a, a commune at one point that's not taught very often, but it is based in real life and it's quite interesting um psychology and internal struggles as i said and then also how that psychologically psychologically struggling person interacts with society so man versus himself and man versus society those types of conflicts are what i'd like you to look for for the most part in these at least in the two stories you're going to be reading or one of the two depending on when you're taking this class um we really don't have man versus man. And even we don't have man versus nature, but we do have man struggling with himself and then also the people around him kind of as a group. And allegory. His writing does have hidden moral messages, but possibly not the ones of his Puritan ancestors. And that's one basic way that it that it it differs. And sometimes it's didactic, teaching the audience a lesson. But I think in his short stories, at least, that the message isn't so overpowering that we lose the plot. And uh, to me, that's, that's kind of important. So here is an overview of the minister's black veil. In the Puritan town of Milford, Reverend Hooper has been a kind and jovial minister, meaning he's kind of jolly and friendly. However... One day, he appears in the church wearing a black veil that covers his entire face, except for his mouth and chin. It flutters when he breathes, and the sight disturbs and perplexes the townspeople. They don't know why he's wearing the veil in front of his face. I like this picture because you kind of get the idea of the type of veil. I, I really pictured it kind of incorrectly the first time I read it through, so I wanted a picture to sort of show it to you guys. Um, for his own reasons, Hooper refuses to move remove the veil he wears it everywhere creating a separation between himself and the rest of the town and they begin to sort of become afraid of him so they're very moved by his sermons and they keep coming to his church and yet there's something sort of separating him from them his fiance elizabeth is not afraid but when he refuses to mo- remove the veil, even for her, she calls off the wedding. She doesn't want a life of isolation. Now, what I'd like you to watch for, too, is how Elizabeth um, reacts after calling off the wedding. The veil seems to make him a better minister, and some find it a comfort. And they begin to confide in him because they think maybe he has some secrets of his own. Now, I'm not really telling you the ending, but I do want you to know kind of the setup and the premise of this story. So things to consider in symbolism, what this is a man in a veil with a beard and a very odd hat, uh, but sort of dressed in that manner. This was, I believe, for a, a play, a stage play version. What does the veil represent? Is it a secret sin? Does he have hidden motives? Is it a separation from people or perhaps from God? Or is it a separation from people to become closer to himself and God? Um, Think about what that could represent. And again, you know, with interpretation, you're making a claim about the best way to interpret a text. So these Oops, sorry. These don't have easy answers. There, there isn't necessarily one correct answer. So whichever one you think is most correct and then how you back that up. 
Why does Hooper wear the veil? Why does he refuse to remove it? Why does Elizabeth continue a friendship with him even though they don't marry? Why doesn't she just decide to marry him? All of these things go to psychology and also the conflict, the, the internal conflict, but also him sort of versus society. Elizabeth represents that society, but it's not necessarily like he's the protagonist and she's the antagonist. Themes of public versus private life, isolation, alienation, comfort, religion, and spiritual and success. And the message, what do you think the author wants the audience to believe about humanity or about these themes? What is his message about how Hooper has chosen to live his life? Our next story is Young Goodman Brown. And this is a painting um, of a scene somewhat like the one depicted in the story um the the person with the or the thing with the goat head there being a demon and then these women kind of crowding around this demon in in a weird way listening to what he's teaching and writing their names in his book in the puritan village of salem uh, young Goodman Brown is going on a journey and will be gone for the night. His wife Faith wears pink ribbons in her hair and bids him goodbye, but is worried. On his journey, Brown encounters a man who claims that he knew Brown's father and grandfather, as well as other members of the church in New England and even the governor of Massachusetts, the person who's been put in charge before the state becomes a state. Brown realizes this is the devil, but he follows a villager into the woods and he watches the devil's dark ceremony. At first, he's shocked. All these good people of Salem are dancing and signing their names in the book of the devil, and he's forced to make a decision. Should he live a life of isolation apart from the townspeople, or should he give up his faith and follow the crown? The crowd. At the end of the story, and I won't tell you what the decision is he made, but the end of the story, he questions reality. Did it happen? Was it just a dream? Does it even matter? And that is kind of the key there. And before I move on to a little bit of the, the things to consider in your interpretation, this is sort of what I mean by being a, a truly American voice. The idea that there are um, witches being accused in Salem of doing dark deeds and signing their name in the devil's book. It's not that they didn't have witches in Europe, but the Puritan culture, um, once the the Puritans came to this country, um, as well as the pilgrims, kind of two separate groups, though sometimes confused with each other. Um, when the Puritans came to this country, really is quite American. The, the religious ideas that are in this story, um, the, the way that the town is described. Salem's not too far from here, and if you've ever had a chance to go, um, similarly Plymouth, not too far away depending on how far you think things are far, I guess. Um, but if you've been to either one of those places, the, the topography, meaning how the, um, the land is described, is there as well. So the social setting, as well as the physical setting, are very much um, American in this story. So things to consider in Young Goodman Brown. Again, a painting up there sort of depicting part of the story. Um, romanticism. Again, that's the literary movement that Hawthorne is writing in. How does he explore the past? How does the story fit in with those gothic traditions of looking at the fantastic, darker aspects of humanity? Does the devil sort of represent... Um, is it meant to be a character as the devil or is it meant to represent something sort of darker inside of us? And what exactly is he being tempted to do? Is the temptation to join the group or is the temptation to stay alone and be apart from it? Um, what's the danger in both of those things? Some of the symbolism Faith's pink ribbons, the way that she is described, the names I don't have in here, but obviously good men um, and good lady are, are not uh, goody. If you ever read The Crucible, goody wife and goody proctor and all that. Um, but the, the way that their names are used, um, the road, what that represents, the journey, the town, the forest, the circle, the townspeople. Why, what does, uh, like the minister's black veil, what decisions 
does he make and why? Was the entire ceremony in his imagination? Did it really happen? Does it matter? <laughs> um, what are his motivations? Why is he doing what he's doing? Why does Faith do, do what she does? Why do the townspeople do what they do? What's the devil's motivation other than to, to get people's names in the book? Why approach him as opposed to just letting him come to the ceremony? Um, as a character, that's kind of interesting. Isolation, alienation, faith, love, and public versus private life. So themes very similar to the minister's black veil, which is why I like to pair these up a lot of times. And then finally, what does the author want the audience to think or believe about humanity and the themes listed above? What is his ultimate um, point that he's trying to make for the audience? And that concludes... Um, that concludes our lecture on Nathaniel Hawthorne. I hope that you will join me again for the next lecture where we'll be looking at another author of short fiction. Thanks so much. Have a wonderful day.